the Chinese dream of selling this car all over Europe. Electric cars, electric cars, EV460. EV460 means uh, you can drive 460 kilometers within one inch recharge, this model. Not only is the car electronic and economical, but most importantly, it is a third cheaper than its European competitors. It's around 30, 30 uh, thousand US dollar, this, this cars. But we can get some support from government. That means it can uh, decrease the, the price. <laughs> Xiu Feng is the managing director of one of the largest automobile companies in China, Xiangang. He's not shy about his future goals. Our vision is to build the world's leading uh, automobile enterprise. So this is our target, also our, you know, our future. Being the leader. <laughs> yes, you're right. OK, bye bye. The company already has three factories in Chongqing. This one employs 4,000 people. The factory is ultra-modern, entirely automated, and able to produce a car every 53 seconds. To fulfill its goal of flooding the international market with these new products, China has a plan, the new Silk Road. Over the next 40 years, the Chinese will build train tracks, shipping lines, and roads going towards Europe, Asia, and Africa. They will also set up railway stations, ports and industrial zones along the way. The objective is to redesign the political and economic world maps to work in their favour. It was the Chinese President Xi Jinping himself who concocted this plan. The first time he mentioned it was on the 7th of September 2013 during a speech he made at Astana University in Kazakhstan. To forge closer economic ties, deepen cooperation and expand development space in the Eurasian region, we should take an innovative approach and jointly build an economic belt along the Silk Road. This will be a great undertaking benefiting the people of all countries along the route. With a trillion dollar investment, the new Silk Road is the most expensive development plan in human history. China will export its capital, its technology, its dreams of prosperity, and above all, its people and their unique ways. We're about to embark on a journey to three of the key countries along the new Silk Road. First up, Djibouti in the Horn of Africa, where the Chinese have taken over from the French as the major economic power. When we leave the door open, there are others who come. Second stop, Ethiopia, where factories are springing up like mushrooms, driving the farmers out of their lands. And finally, Gwadar in Pakistan. We have managed to gain access to one of the most closed-off areas to Western media. No, 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 you are Bob. Here, China's great project has been met with armed resistance. China, you came here without our consent. An investigation into China's new project of world domination. It all begins in Chongqing, on the banks of the Yangtze Kiang River. You've probably never heard of it, yet it is in the very heart of China, one of the largest cities in the world, with 30 million inhabitants, more than double the amount of those living in Ile-de-France. 
In the 1940s, the city had just 1.5 million inhabitants living in small wooden houses on stilts. The river was the only thing that connected them to the rest of the country. Nowadays, Chongqing prides itself on being the starting point of the new Silk Road. Chu Shifan is a member of the Bureau of the Chinese Communist Party, responsible for the Chongqing Railway Networks. Every morning, on his way to work, he passes by the zero-kilometer monument, the pride of the city. This is the place where the first freight train departed for Europe in March 2014. Originally a small provincial railway station, over the past five years, Chongqing has become the largest railway hub in southwestern China. Xu Shifan is the son of a railway worker and a railway worker himself. As a party member, his job is to know about everything that goes on at the station. The powerful locomotive won't go very far today. The railway line hasn't been fully electrified yet. Every day, three trains leave Chongqing for Europe, just like this one. 40 wagons packed full of clothes, mobile phones and chemical products. The journey takes 15 days. 60 drivers take shifts along the 10,000 kilometer long railway line. The train bypasses Tibet and crosses the Xinjiang region before traveling through five countries, Kazakhstan, Russia, Belarus, and Poland. The journey comes to an end in Duisburg, Germany. From there, the goods will be shipped all over Europe. With its new railway, the city of Chongqing is attracting more and more large companies, such as Hewlett Packard or Foxconn, Apple's main subcontractor. A third of the world's computers and millions of printers and cars come out of these factories every year. The city is also attracting small high-tech entrepreneurs. Electronics and computer companies occupy every floor of this building such as Ying Chu's company. At 56 years old, this engineer is one of China's Bluetooth experts. Before starting his company, he worked at Microsoft in California for 12 years. Ying Chu currently employs around 30 people, including a dozen engineers. The company manufactures electronic chips for connected products, but above all, it is a place for innovation. Jin Chu has already patented 60 inventions, the latest being a geolocated anti-aggression mechanism disguised as a jeweled bracelet. Uh, this uh, is for ladies also, because there is something inside and he can automatically sensor. If you have the emergency, you just uh, with this uh, the gesture, Tra, tra, so three times, he will automatically pull the phone to call the, the people you press reset, indicate you have something emergency happens. The products are sold to supermarket chains and video game makers, as well as to individuals on Amazon. Today, Jin Chu has received an order for Bluetooth sensors. He must export them to Germany via the new Silk Road. Thanks to the railway line, the delivery of the goods is 12 times cheaper than going by plane and twice as fast as going by boat. Now we have the window open to us. Maybe that's we can compete. In terms of cost and time, we can compare with uh, Shanghai now. 
As a result of these companies' successes, Jinchu City continues to grow, welcoming 200,000 new inhabitants each year. This is rush hour. A little bit rushes at regular time. See? With his young wife, the company director leaves work early to come home and look after his children. They live in a luxury residence on the 25th floor of this building. We're back. Yeah. The couple have two children, 11 and 9 years old. <laughs> and a full-time nanny. <laughs> the TV is on in the living room, but no cartoons. Jin Chu's eldest son is in the middle of watching a video maths class in English. One, C2, all the way through CK, and then we want to know the slope, the derivative. The young boy is bursting with ambition. When I was young, my dream... You always young. <laughs> I was young. I was a kid. Uh, when I was a kid, I, uh, my dream is to be an uh, astronaut. But, but right now, I want to be... Software engineer? Yes, a software oh, engineer. Just yeah. like my father. He has better chance, so he should be better. <laughs> Before he took a gamble on the new Silk Road, Jin Chu had a different life. His career is extraordinary for the son of a provincial teacher. Thanks to a scholarship, he was able to study engineering in Shanghai and then in the United States. He also had several high-flying jobs in Silicon Valley. In San Francisco, I bought this place called Acura. It's about 20 years ago. Yes, I have a car, a house, and uh, I suppose it worked very good. My parents think I'm crazy. On the other hand, they think oh, that's good because doing back at that time, America is a heaven. Here is close to hell. Today, the entrepreneur's life has changed completely. He can afford to dine at the best restaurants in Chongqing. Tonight, he orders the typical regional dish, a sort of heavily spiced fondue, into which diners dip shrimp fritters, vegetables, or even beef tripe. Jin Chu is keenly aware of how much has changed. His city is on its way to becoming one of the world's new economic centers. You feel the dynamic here. <laughs> I don't know why, because we're so poor for so long time. So people are thinking, okay, it's time to change. Especially when, when you get rich, it's not a crime anymore. <laughs> That's good. Okay, the people is, they just get crazy. Nowadays, Chongqing is home to almost 100 multimillionaires. At the city's train station, it's almost midnight. We meet up with Zhu Shifan, the railway worker who will show us around. He wants to show us how the station is now functioning at full capacity, ever since the trains to Europe were added to the local traffic. All night long, this old locomotive transports wagons through a maze of train tracks, taking them to the dock where they will be loaded up. The operation is scheduled down to the minute, a ballot of cranes and porticos throughout the night. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
These containers are bound for Poland with thousands of computer screens inside. The men have two minutes to position each container in order to keep up with the pace. He will... Our Communist Party tour guide is very proud of his trains. Yet so far, the railway is not making profit. The Chinese were so ambitious, they put the cart before the horse. Half of the wagons return from Europe empty. And for now, Beijing absorbs the deficit. But for the Chinese authorities, it doesn't matter how long it takes. The aim of the new Silk Road is, above all, for China to extend its influence throughout the world. Currently, the priority route goes through Djibouti, a former French colony strategically located by the Red Sea, a gateway to conquer Africa. Djibouti is one of the smallest African states, a poor country, a quasi-desert with the exception of the capital. The Chinese began by investing in the port. With their money, the Djiboutian authorities were offered eight state-of-the-art tugboats, like this one. Captain Humat was at the helm that day. This is the last model. It's a beautiful boat. It does everything you want. There's no problem. Before, we had remarkable remarks that were done manually. There were the speeds that were in the machine that were in the machine. They said, stop, advance. And now, there's no more than that. Everyone is happy. There's no problem with the navigator. There's no problem with the pilots. There's no problem with the navigator. There's no problem with the pilots. The captain knows his customers well. This freighter flies the Panamanian flag, but comes from China, as do the majority of boats that dock in Djibouti. It is 180 meters long and 33 meters wide. Not easy to maneuver. With the wind, it's a bit dangerous. What's going on? The half of the boat is going to break. What's going on? Inshallah. What's going on? 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 Three hours later, the huge freighter arrives safe and sound at the Chinese port, as it is called in Djibouti. Hassan will take charge of the boat. He is the team leader. <laughs> Hassan has a dozen dockers under his orders, all Djiboutian. There are no Chinese people to be seen, even though everything here comes from China. The cranes that unload the cargo and the goods, these trucks, the building materials, and these tanks too. Even some of the staff were trained in China. <laughs> It was China who loaned Djibouti the money to build this deep water port two years ago, $580 million. To make it a profitable facility, they must move quickly. Hassan has targets to meet, and it isn't always easy. <laughs> When things become tricky, the young team leader doesn't hesitate to get his hands dirty. If he doesn't meet his targets, he risks missing out on his premium. But he doesn't resent the Chinese. They gave us a chance to realize all this, to realize our dream, because there are many young Djiboutians who are waiting for the future of this country. It makes us happy. And we are happy to be here. But all this comes with a price. But all this comes with a price. Djibouti is now tied to China, who owns 70% of its debt. 
On land, the Chinese are beginning to build. They have even installed a military base, the first Chinese military base abroad. At its inauguration, two years ago, they rolled out the red carpet for the Djiboutian president. With this base, China has positioned itself alongside these major world powers, the Americans, the Italians, the Japanese and the French. France's military base houses 1,500 soldiers. Ever since the 19th century, they have understood just how important this small territory is. Djibouti aurait pu n'être rien d'autre que l'un de ces petits territoires d'outre-mer, si sa situation exceptionnelle sur la mer Rouge n'en faisait obligatoirement l'un des ports français les plus importants d'au-delà des mers. Ajoutons que ce port est le déversoir naturel de l'Éthiopie grâce à l'unique voie ferrée construite et exploitée par des Français qui assure le trafic avec Addis Abeba. Djibouti, c'est une part de l'avenir français. Nowadays, this is all that remains of the French colonial footprint, one of Africa's first railway stations built in 1917, now abandoned. Replaced in 2017 by the new Chinese train system, the project cost nearly $4.4 billion to be repaid to China over 15 years. The railway connects Djibouti to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. It carries both goods and passengers. A vital artery for this great country that has no maritime access. Every two days at dawn, a crowd gathers in front of the station for the 8 a.m. train. Most of the passengers are traders. They arrive loaded with goods. The station manager tries to maintain some order, assisted by a policeman. The trader has to leave his bottles of oil behind, but eventually manages to get through with the rest of his luggage. Abdurrahman, the station manager, is frustrated. He will be held accountable for this. Unlike at the port, where the Djiboutians are in charge, at the station, the Chinese run the show. Here, the real boss is this man in the striped T-shirt. But they don't seem keen to talk. We, uh, I think he's uh, the captain of the uh, And then he's the, from, uh, the responsible of the uh, oh, uh, passengers. <laughs> The railway line will be under Chinese control until 2024. But they seem unwilling to share this, or to show Djiboutians taking orders from the Chinese. In the offices, instead, they call it working in partnership. Et vous voyez aussi ici, il y a un chiffrement qui est responsable aussi du management. Il s'appelle Harry. Et à côté de lui aussi, il y a un Djiboutien pour aussi le transfert de commission. Il s'appelle Moussa. Il est responsable aussi des achats. Comme ça, ils travaillent ensemble. Ils travaillent ensemble, right? Oui, ils travaillent ensemble. Il est mon boss. <laughs> 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 really? 
Non. Euh, Peut-être que demain, il pourrait être bon, ça. Hein. Bon, Aujourd'hui, ils travaillent ensemble, mais demain, euh, ça reste à lui de continuer. Oui. Thank you. Hein. Merci beaucoup et travaillez bien. There seems to be some unease between the Chinese and the Djiboutians. On the tracks, you can hear a pin drop. Les Chinois, leur seule langue de communication, c'est le travail. Si vous travaillez avec eux, et vous vous comprenez facilement. Vous n'avez même pas besoin de, de parler des Chinois. Parce que le travail, tellement qu'ils travaillent très fort, que vous, vous allez vraiment suivre et correctement et savoir ce qu'ils font. Ils travaillent plus fort que les Djiboutiens euh, Ben oui, c'est normal. C'est la Chine. Quand il comes à loading up the goods, les Djiboutiens take on these more strenuous tasks under a blazing sun. The Chinese tend to occupy positions of higher responsibility, which are better paid. <laughs> Abdul Razak in the striped t-shirt and his friend Mohamed have been railway workers for just over a year. They find it hard to accept this hierarchy. <laughs> The two friends have been assigned the thankless task of hooking up the wagons. They take us to the engine cabin, away from the others, where no one can hear us except the drivers, who don't speak French. The men are particularly frustrated having won a competition to undergo training in China to be in charge of this operation themselves. Ça, c'est comme les pistons. Avant, arrière. Avant, arrière. Ça, c'est ce qu'on appelle, c'est le brick valve. Ça, on a étudié en Chine. Je sais, le brick valve, c'est au niveau du, du frein, du frein. Chaque fois, on le fait sortir l'air un peu. Hoping to get a promotion, Abdul Razak even learned Mandarin. But when he came back from China, his dreams were quashed. Lui, il avait préparé en Chine six mois de formation en locomotif. Il parle en chinois, il comprend tous ces caractères-là. Pourquoi vous conduisez pas le train Il ne conduit pas, il est avec moi Je pour détacher et couper. C'est ça le problème. Ce n'est pas notre domaine. Nous, moi, j'avais fait en Chine la locomotive, ce qu'on appelle la maintenance du locomotive, comment réparer. On avait fait là-bas, mais à Jouti, lorsqu'on est venu, je ne sais pas ce qui s'est passé. On m'a ramené ici à <rire> C'est ça le problème. Si, 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 si. The Djiboutians have at least another five years to go before they can manage the railway themselves. This railway line is a crucial part of China's plans for the new Silk Road. At the end of the line, 750 kilometers away, lies Ethiopia, a country with 110 million inhabitants, one of the highest growth rates in all of Africa. In the capital, Addis Ababa, buildings are springing up like mushrooms. China has already built a ring road. And the tramway. Now, the focus is on delocalizing its industry. 50 kilometers south of the capital lies a monumental park. Workshops as far as the eye can see and streets that bear the names of Chinese cities or provinces. It is Ethiopia's main Chinese economic zone. The boss, Mr. Zhuao, is a Chin Africa pioneer. It's been 21 years since he first set foot in Ethiopia. He was one of the first to sense the country's potential. You know, in China, now many companies they are looking for the, another place to invest because in China now the cost is increased. Labor's salary and the power is increased. But here in Ethiopia, labor cost is low. 
Mr. Zhao regularly pays visits to the SMEs he manages. This particular one makes jeans and exports them to Europe, where they are sold at a moderate price. The average salary of an Ethiopian worker is $56 a month, 10 times less than the average Chinese worker. At this price, the head of the company has had to invest in training up his workforce. When they employ these uh, local uh, peoples, that time they, they don't know how to uh, operate. Now through training, it's OK. Yeah, uh, similar like Chinese. Yeah. The efficiency now, he is now, if he is a Chinese person, he can be a Chinese person. Three people can be a Chinese person. Three people can be a Chinese I think it's good. Yeah. Because within a short time, they give training. Yeah. As in Djibouti, everything is imported from China. Sewing machines, methods and supervisors. She addresses the workers in a gibberish of Chinese, English and Amharic, a local language. The workshops are open six days a week. At 6 p.m., everybody goes home. Well, almost everyone. The Chinese supervisors stay behind at the factory. Li Yan is 35 years old. Every evening, she has dinner with her colleagues. With their salary, they are able to afford housing in the city, but they prefer to live on the premises. <laughs> Uh, Li Yan earns $2,800 a month. It's a lot of money, yet she sleeps in a very basic room. The dormitory is just 20 square meters, shared with two other colleagues. They live like university students, yet they all have children of their own. Li Yan left her husband and three children behind in China. <laughs> Li Yan has just 15 holiday days a year to go back to China and see her family. <laughs> but for the young woman and her friends, it doesn't seem like a sacrifice. Every evening, they end the day by watching a film to improve their English. Always first down. Never bright then the 
The next day we meet with Mr. Zhao, the director of the industrial park. He regularly receives visits from Chinese businessmen here. But today he is hosting some unusual visitors, high school teachers. They have come over from Hong Kong to scout out future opportunities for their students. So with his new visitors, Mr. Zhao plays the patriotic card. It looks as if the future generation of expats are gearing up, and China is already anticipating the next step. The school teacher's trip has been entirely subsidized by a lobby like NGO run by a politician close to Xi Jinping. Our young kids, we are, we, they need the future development, the career, the career planning, right? So as a principal, we need to tell them to, to what's their future for the career development. Because Hong Kong is just a small island. Yeah, uh, it's over at, uh, developed, so they need some more. Mr. Zhao is constantly expanding his business space. He has managed to persuade the Ethiopian authorities to give him more land for his industrial zone. Chinese company, most of them, they have the profit here. And also Ethiopian government, they collect taxes, they have job uh, opportunity, also it's a benefit. So this is a win-win, I think. Uh, that side, that site is our second phase. We are waiting that land. From the other side of this fence, Mr. Joao cannot see those who are most affected by this operation. The farmers in the area, like Maru, he was expropriated from his land to make room for the industrial zone. Soon, all of these fields will be covered with factories. <laughs> Maru was given 20 cents worth of compensation per square meter he lost, $6,700 for his three hectares, a fair sum which was quickly depleted as he lost his livelihood. At 58 years old, this is all he has left. This small house and a few animals that have nowhere to go and graze. He now has to go out and buy food to feed them. The farmer and his wife have seven children. They always made sure that they received a good education. But despite her degree, the youngest has only been able to find a factory job unstable and poorly paid.
እዚህ የሚመረተው አንድም እዚህ ጋር የሚያኛን የሚያገለግል ነገር የለም ወደ ሌላ ነገር ነው የሚሄዱ ማደጉ ብቻ ሳይሆን ድሮኛ ለምንም ነገር ገንዘብ አናወጣ ወተቱ ቤት አለ እህሉ ቤት አለ ላሙ አለ ፍየሉ አለ በጉ አለ ይሄ ከፍት ከፍት ነው ይሄ ነው በቃ አብርን ተንቀጥቀጠ እኔ ዘና ያለ ነው ይሄ It seems as if nothing will stop the Silk Road steamroller in Africa and around the world. Not even on riskier ground. In Pakistan, China plans to invest 62 billion dollars over the next 15 years. Our investigation takes us to Gwadar in the Balochistan province in southern Pakistan. A small fishing port. This rustic jetty will soon be gone, giving way to a new industrial port capable of receiving large freighters. The Chinese want to make it one of the key stopping points along the Silk Road. The overall project is to connect Kashgar in western China to Gwadar on the Arabian Sea with a network of roads and railways. The aim to bring China closer to the oil wells and offer a shortcut for the transportation of goods by going around the Straits of Malacca, controlled by the US. The ultimate goal to open new routes into Africa and Europe. We are the only Western reporters with permission to film in Gwadar. We arrive at the only hotel in the city, a five-star hotel on top of a cliff with a breathtaking view of the harbor. The establishment is highly protected by the military and the intelligence services. We soon notice the army helicopters that circle the city overhead and the numerous checkpoints that protect access to the port. The city is hosting its great annual fair, the Gwadar Expo, in this large building by the harbor. But despite prior permission, we are not allowed in. We sneak in with an official. The director of the port, Nazia Kashani, agrees to take us in his car. Let's go. He's very anxious to promote his port, even if it means going against the intelligence services who have denied us access. His secretary has been warned about us. <laughs> The entrance to the port is guarded by 15 soldiers. Upon seeing our camera, they stop the car. Chairman Gwadar Port. Hello? Yes, sir. Chairman Gwadar Port, what are you doing? Yes, sir. Okay. Chairman Gwadar Port, what are you doing? Yes, sir. I'm here. I'm here. Welcome. Welcome to the danger in Gwadar. What is the main point of security? Danger in Gwadar? No, there is no danger, it's just a protection, okay? Okay. Mm. Thanks to the director, we make it past the checkpoints. What he hasn't told us is that there is indeed danger in Gwadar. The Chinese projects have been greatly controversial and are regularly the targets of terror attacks. Two years ago, three men armed with Kalashnikovs attacked the Chinese consulate in Karachi, the country's economic capital. They blew up the guard post, killing four people before being shot by the police. The 
province of Baluchistan, where Gwada is located, is also the scene of a separatist rebellion that kills hundreds of people each year. In their videos broadcast online, the separatists directly threaten China. China, you came here without our consent, supported our enemies, helped Pakistani military in wiping our villages. Baluchistan will be a graveyard for your expansionist motives. President Xi Jinping, you still have time to quit Baluchistan. At the Guada Expo, however, it looks as if China's time is far from up. In fact, Pakistan has created a special force of 15,000 men to protect the Chinese projects. Outside the building, portraits of the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan and the Chinese President Xi Jinping hang side by side. Inside, Chinese companies and businessmen are everywhere. There is even a Chinese company launching halal meat and charcuterie. This is all meat, huh? Yeah. Chinese meat. Chinese meat, okay. So you see a market in China of uh, Chinese meat in Pakistan, huh? Yeah. The locals are a bit confused. At the conference center, officials celebrate the good and strong relationship between the two countries. The Pakistani national anthem placed during the ceremony. But when it comes to the full operation of the port, a Chinese company is in charge. Their big boss is also Chinese, despite being dressed in traditional Pakistani clothing, Zhang Baozong. I promise you, we will have a break with the cooperation, and with uh, your leadership, the two brothers, we work strongly together, and uh, bring you a very good result of your wise choice. Long live Pakistan China Fellowship. Thank you. The man has built a career in Africa and the Middle East. He knows exactly how to deal with local dignitaries. <laughs> I'm so grateful uh, for the investors to come, for the senior government officer to come. And also many friends from China? A lot. So I'm so excited. You always feel happy when you meet all the friends. Everyone seems happy today. Including you. <laughs> in fact, these major works and China's hegemonic ambitions are a concern, even for those living far off in the West. Zhang Baozong gives us a few minutes of his time. Away from the others, he brushes off the critics. You are trying to imagine why Chinese want to develop Guada. Chinese must have some interest in it. That's your... That's your of an imagination. The only, the sole purpose of a Chinese company come here to help to develop Gwadar is for the development of Gwadar, development of Balochistan, and development of Pakistan. Of course, if this place is uh, well developed, any part of the world, including China, including France, also will benefit from such a nice development. Benefits for all? In Guada, this looks unlikely. Meeting up to talk freely with the locals is no easy task. We must avoid the intelligence services and are not permitted to leave the hotel without a military escort. We find a more discreet way to go into the city center. Baluchistan is Pakistan's poorest province. Most people here live on less than $2 a day. In Gwadar, the majority of families fish for a living, like Rani. He lives with his five brothers and sisters and their families. In total, 36 people live in this house. For now, at least, they have seen no benefits from the projects in Gwadar. Their life is as difficult as it has ever been.
Today, the house has no water or electricity. In fact, in general, living conditions have deteriorated. Ever since the port was built, fishermen have been finding it more and more difficult to find fish. Ghani fears that he and his family will be driven out of their home. But we don't get the chance to talk about it properly. We have been discovered. The Pakistani intelligence services come knocking at the door. Face to face with the agents, the fisherman claims to have no idea what we are doing there. We insist on accompanying him to his boat. The street is filled with soldiers and intelligence officials. Apparently, they don't like being on camera. They want to make sure that we don't tarnish the image of Gwadar's development. <laughs> The beach where Ghani's boat is anchored is, in itself, the subject of disagreement between the fishermen and the authorities. The plan is to get rid of it, to make way for a brand new motorway leading to the port. The building site has already begun to slowly erode the coastline. Following a fisherman's strike, the authorities recently agreed to keep one end of the beach untouched. But faced with China's grand ambitions, this may be nothing but a suspended sentence. The fishermen might still one day be replaced by these cranes. Fifteen days after our filming, the attacks in Gwadar intensify. Just down the road, the Baluch rebels attack a bus, killing 14 Pakistani soldiers. Then, on May the 11th, the rebels storm the Grand Hotel in Gwadar, killing five people. When it comes to Gwadar, the Chinese have not yet won the battle of the new Silk Road, but they have set the wheels in motion. According to the Beijing authorities, China's great project is set to be completed by 2049, the 100th anniversary of the birth of the People's Republic of China.